Okay. So according to everything I can tell, we are live on the YouTubes. My glossy forehead and all. Um, so first off, hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jimmy and Johnny show. Okay. Okay. So according to everything I can tell, we are live on the YouTube. I'm double feeding on the YouTube. This is awesome. Okay. But kind of similar but different. We got my man Stan Weiss as a guest today. Jimmy, my partner in crime, he is on his 25th wedding anniversary and he's out on a date with his wife in 25 years. Big important to say that, I guess. Um, so anyway, I asked my buddy Stan Weiss um, and Stan and I got a bunch of stuff to share with the world. Um, first off, hello, Stan. How are we doing today? We're doing good. Any better, I'd be twins. What is that shirt you got on there, man? It was a gift with all the grandchildren's name on them. So it works out pretty good. I could show it. So it says like yeah. E is for Paxton, O is for Owen. Uh, oh, one of the P's is for Kendall because there's no K. <laughs> One says Sawyer and the other one says Sydney. So that's all the grandkids, five of them. So, so. so old enough to have five grandkids, uh, you know, live live the lives of two people. So, uh, so Stan, give us a little bit of background on yourself, and then I'll dive into some other stuff. And we got some cool topics to talk about today. Yeah, my background it started off in uh, food with Wendy's International. Working as that lonely assistant manager, working six hours, six days a week, open to close mostly, because that's the way you did it back in the old days. And then uh, I remember in Wendy's, one of the best things I like is they used to be in blue and white stripes. Remember those with the little Gatsby hat? Oh yeah. Well, I was the I was the first manager to come in that had regular shirts for a time, so everybody was pissed off because I was the new guy on the block. And here it was. I'm dressed, up, I'm dressed up and they get to wear these things. Even the manager of the store is pretty funny. But anyhow, I worked my way through up into multi unit, had a great time there. Uh, learned a lot from mostly about systems, which was really my foundation in terms of my learning. And then I went into uh, airport business with a gentleman who, uh, who owned some concessions. We built that company up from like six to eight um, places to over 40. And, uh, all these different airports all over the country, an Air Force base, uh, college, university. We had a really good, fun time with that. Um, got tired of traveling, went to uh, work at H&R Block, big name in taxes. I always got my taxes done. You know, it was, so, it was the old thing where mom and dad got their taxes done at H&R Block at Sears. So what did I do? I got H&R Block done. So... Uh, ended up working for them, and uh, it was a really good time for eight years. And then uh, leadership changed different things, and uh, went and helped out a couple of people start up their uh, operations in tax resolution. A lot of people in the world are, you know, behind on taxes; they don't know what to do. So we helped them out a lot. And then I go to a hockey game in North Carolina and say, "Wow, well, look at my guy, Jonathan. See what's up? How you doing? What's going on?" Before I know it, we're working together again. So. Long story short is Johnson used to work for me in the old days when I was in the airport business. First, he was a vendor. And uh, we came, became very close in communication. We saw things alike. And I said, hey, you want to take over at Dulles Airport and, and Reagan National Airport? And that grew for him for a little while. So uh, we did that together, created a lot of systems, a lot of different developmental things for our people. We saw some huge, huge successes. So. That's about me. I'm uh, I'm out here having fun. Like I say, five grandchildren. Been married will be 40 years in February, and uh, just seeing what the future holds in terms of uh, continuing growing where we're doing. Yeah, so that was good. That was a great little summary. The uh, so yeah, so you went and saw this guy in North Carolina going to a Bruins game against the Hurricanes. That didn't work out so well for the Bruins, if I remember. Um, no. So. Uh, but then you had some vindication, right? You you were at you were at the game that they lost. You were watching the game that they lost to Tampa, and everybody from North Carolina was crying and all this other stuff. So uh, yeah, I was cheering for Tampa Bay, and then when Tampa Bay got it, I said, "Let's kick their butt," and uh, and hopefully they'll lose, and they lost to Colorado. So I was pretty happy. <laughs> Praying for people to lose, I love it. 
So, yeah, so Stan and I met many years ago in the airports. Um, and it, it's kind of a, a full circle, which is really, really exciting. It's creating exciting times in my companies. So we met, I was a vendor of his originally. I owned a company that cleaned exhaust systems and did all kinds of services for restaurants. And my background was always in restaurants. So I had this company and we happened to have the contract at Dulles Airport. And, you know, one day I go there and I, you know, I, I got to meet the people and who have the concessions. And I run into this guy, Stan. I'm like, this MF, right? From Boston, rugged, like rough, right? You know, like, hey, this is what I need, you know? Um, and it was awesome. It was awesome. And we became friends and we would talk and we would talk about restaurants and he, uh, he tried to recruit me so many damn times. So I'm like, you can't afford me. And I was getting married at the time. That's how far back this goes. And I was like, you know what, God, I really like should look to do something different. You know, that type of business was a lot at night, right? It was good. It was great. I had crews out, but it was, you know, I just, I, it was funny. My wife at the time, she had, uh, she worked during the day, right? She'd get home at like six o'clock at night and I'd be like, uh, okay, see you later. I'm going to go out and check on everybody. So it was like, not the best when you're looking down the road and Stan just having to offer me a great job. He's like, Hey, I want you to like, you know, take over Dulles national, uh, Pittsburgh. And then we ended up in BWI the longest night of my life. Right. The, uh, you know, the, uh, Hitler's got the night of a thousand knives or whatever, you know, we had a night where we transitioned. There were 42 restaurants in the BWI airport and we had half of them and another company had the other half and they, we literally, we had, so we had about 24, if I remember, and literally we, the first night we, it was like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, terrible timing, but we closed as a Burger King. And then by the next morning, 7 a.m., it opened as a Charlie's Grilled Subs. It was a Pizza Hut and it opened as something else. It was a, a Starbucks. The next morning, it opened as Caribou Coffee. And we did that 24 times over in the course of two evenings. And I remember, I remember I wore a suit. And I was in the same suit 48 hours later. <laughs> right? We had tractor trailers parked out on the tarmac. We had to get like approval, FAA, all this kind of stuff. And like literally two tractor trailers, Burger King, get your shit out. We got to get our stuff in. And like we were waiting for them. They had to clear like out their refrigerators, their storage, like logistics out the wazoo. And it was pretty wild and it worked amazingly and we got it done and it was a huge success. And that was like, you know, one of those nights I'll never forget for as long as I live. It was one night that was three, but you know, that's the type of work that we did. And we were the type of people that you went to, to do the impossible. And we had it and we still have this GSD mentality, get shit done. Right. If any man can right? So Jimmy, if he was here, he'd be like, if any man can, then I can. So we know that we can do it. So what happened was Stan came up and I've known Stan forever. We've kept in contact. I'm in Atlanta a lot. The uh, So, but Stan was doing this tax thing and kind of, you know, he was off on doing other things. And I just, I felt like he was unavailable to me. So when I came in and, and I had, had taken over Prana Wash and ultimately bought the entirety of the franchise company, it wasn't a resource that I thought the tap, like, and smack me now, um, you know, the, uh, so you know, here I am two years later and, you know, we're right now at like this fever pitch, but at the same time, we're like, we had just finished rebranding. We had changed a huge portion of how we were operating. We were operating a lot of the franchises for a long time and we're going with a much more traditional franchise model. And it's, and he just happened to come to North Carolina right at the right time. And we got to talk and he's like, Hey, I'm available. Like, and I'm like, Oh my God. Like, you know, I can't afford him. In fact, like he couldn't afford me back in the day. I couldn't afford him today, but somehow he's sitting here with me now and, and we're building a great company. And I, ironically, he was in Atlanta and Atlanta is like this great market. You know, it's just an MSA, a market segment area of 6 million people. So it's a perfect place for us to, you know, operate from. And we just happen to have the largest property in all of Atlanta called Atlantic Station. So if you've ever heard me talking about these things, they all add up to this moment where here we are 
you know, and we're just fever pitched with growing a franchise business. So when Jimmy couldn't be here today, I was like, oh my goodness, let's get Stan. And I happen to be talking to Stan. We have like a one-on-one -on -one every week at three o'clock. And I'm like, oh my goodness, come join me on this call. We can talk about what we were talking about. <laughs> so I want to talk about a couple things today. I'm even going to share the screen. Um, but we had just gotten off a call where we had been talking to a new master franchise of ours that we're partnered with that has an area right above San Francisco. It's kind of the valley where Berkeley is and all. So it's a really great area, beautiful. Um, and we already have operations in San Francisco. We have San Jose Airport coming up. We already do SFO. So we're already out there. So it just was a good timing. And this was the first new master that Stan and I are onboarding together. And I got off the call and I was like, okay, we need to like get a couple of these things systematized and we need to leverage the tools that we have. Um, and we need to build out, you know, a nice portal essentially where these folks can get all of this information and it's a checklist and anything you do more than once, you know, if you're doing it three times, you should automate it. And I'm like, Stan, we'll build a form. It'll do this. It'll do that. They'll get what they need. You know, boop, 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 boop. All this really crazy high level stuff that, you know, in for him in the past, it was like, you'd think about it, but then he's got to go figure out somebody to build it. You'd call up Z Lee and, uh, you know, get somebody working on something. And, you know, we just have the ability to do that. You know, we have a whole marketing agency. So we're able to do things like that and do it really well. So it just got us talking about what it's, you know, what are we doing and where are we going? And I'm going to bring up a couple of tools. So Stan, in our FDD, right? So there's a franchise disclosure document. So first, let me say a couple things. So full disclosure, anybody who doesn't know me, I own multiple businesses, okay? Um, my name is a title on, I think, close to 30 at this point. Um, I have, I own a, a marketing agency. I own the entirety of an international brand. I own Restaurant Success System. Uh, I own Success System, the parent company of that. I own 50% of eight Pronto Wash operating units, and I'm also partnered on a master and a couple more to come. And I own some cities and masters outright in their entirety. And I am the chairman and CEO of Pronto Wash. And here we are. So full disclosure, that's the background. I'm speaking from my experience. I have a ton of experience growing businesses over the years. And one of the things that I'm not allowed to do. So when you have a franchise company, you either have a thing in your FDD called an item 19. And item 19 basically is the disclosure of the financials for the operating units of the company. So I bought the company in 2020. We've entirely revamped it, added mobile. Mobile's the biggest focus of ours, but we have a lot of fixed sites. We don't have the benchmark to provide item 19. It'll probably cost me a hundred grand just to do it and do it well. So I don't have to have it. I don't, so I don't have it. But when people are looking for a franchise, they like to see item 19. And it's like, okay, I get it. They want to see a PL. So I cannot share a PL with them. But okay, if I'm going to partner with somebody, obviously I can talk about what the business is that we're partnering on and how that works. And as an industry expert, okay, and as an industry expert, I'm the past president of the International Detailing Association. And I built the Prior to Pronto Wash, I built the largest mobile car care company in the world called Spiffy. It's a $60 million company today that I exited in 2019. So the stuff that I'm talking about today is my experience. When I look at things, these are the numbers that I use as a filter. So, you know, as I would say to anybody, you know, Whenever looking to make an investment, consult your your lawyer, your accountant, your doctor, you know, your priest, all of those things. You know, I'm not a professional in any of those categories. Please seek professional advice. The information we share here today is for entertainment value only. So all that being said, Stan, let's talk about some cool shit. <laughs> ah, well said, well said. Yeah, that was good, right? Like, I got to do it. It's like, you know dot my eyes, cross my T's, you know, I got like a lawyer and a priest sitting over here on the couch, you know, one blessing me, the other one cursing me, you guys figure out who's doing what. Okay. So what, what led to this was a couple of things. So we're going to talk about this, which is really cool. 
So this is a, let me share the screen. And if I'm looking this way, folks, I apologize. I have like three gigantic monitors and things show up where they show up. So we're going to go here. Okay. So, so Stan is new to Prada Wash. So we, we spend a lot of time getting people like indoctrinated into how we operate. But the cool thing is, is that the foundation of every business that I've ever built and run is built on the same systems and tools that Stan and I used 20 years ago. So there's just some basics. And you, if you've ever been on a Jimmy and Johnny and heard me make fun of a thing called the call-in sheet, right? There's the inventor of the call-in sheet, folks. Okay. And it just, it's one of those things that makes me giggle because I still call it the call in sheet. I'm on the phone with Stan the other day. He calls it the call in sheet, but today we call it our financial summary. And it's basically whenever you have multiple units, you got to roll those numbers up so you can look at them and aggregate them. But we go back so far that fax machines were prevalent and people used to call into a, a voicemail, probably on like a tape on a machine <laughs> and they would leave their numbers, right? Susie, you know, oh, there's a Susie Freshens 2184 um, sales today. <laughs> and you know, we'd be on the other side, like in the morning, like Ch -ch 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 -ch. we put it into a spreadsheet and, you know, then start calling up and yelling at people about their numbers. But that was different. That's sidebar. We could be here all night on that. So anyway, that's where we go back. And so when, when I look at some of this stuff, I go back to things that have worked before in my life. I don't reinvent the wheel when I do something, but there's no two iterations of it that are ever the same. So like when Stan looks at the financial summary, it looks very similar to what he remembers, but it's got this and it's got a different labor model and it's got other things that we figured out we needed to track over time. This tool here is a tool that I've used for a really long time. And it goes back to even my restaurant days when I had restaurants, we used to have this, which is like a, a, a startup checklist that you basically put everything in order and count down. And it used to be like 12 months and, you know, you finally get to a place and you open a restaurant. Awesome. God, thank the Lord. I'm not doing that. I won't, I won't say much more about it because it's very possible that we'll be introducing a food service franchise here very soon. Um, but I don't want to get into it. But anyway, so to take something that used to take, you know, 12 months and reduce it down to essentially nine weeks is really nice. So if I can get a business from zero to hero in, in just a couple months, then that's good. My investments I'm going to show today are minimal. And the upside of the car wash and detailing business in general is, is really good. And people know that historically car washes, right? Car washing is different. And when you think of like that big building on the corner of, you know, Harrison and Maine, that's a real estate business. That is about having the right piece of property with the most car counts to put the most people through. That's literally what it is. It's a giant factory and you just want to shove things through that factory. We do, one, we have fixed locations, so we have a bit of that, but we want to ramp that up and we like to do additional things. We like to bring the convenience, right? We call it the Amazon effect inside of our company, but we're very much swept up in all this. And I've been doing it since Uber came out, right? The first thing that I did on the car washing side was we built the first mobile app. And back in the day, we used to be, oh, it's the Uber for car washing. Well, if you know anything about those models of people trying to do this marketplace, get a bunch of you know independent contractors to do it, it works in a very small niche, and it only really works in the transportation and taxi industry because to have a true independent contractor, the person needs to come fully trained. Right when you hired an independent contractor, Joe Plummer, and Joe Plummer shows up at your house. You don't give Joe Plummer the tools, the instructions on what to do, the supplies. Joe Plummer shows up with his expertise. He brings his tools. He buys the supplies and charges you for them. He's an independent contract. Well, when you try to do that in any other industry, right? But then when you look at the car industry, people have their own car. They already come trained. It actually qualifies and works. And you see them fighting these you know, national battles. But people try to do that in all kinds of industry. They try to do it with maids. And if we tried to do it, it doesn't work. 
the minute I give them a checklist, I tell them what to do, I give them direction, I make them use my product versus theirs, it'll, it doesn't fly. Somebody's got a loop. Did you get that? There you go. So, um, you have like YouTube open behind you or something or in another browser. So, so it doesn't work in our industry, but we have the ability to actually have like referral partners, right? I can like get out business if, you know, I'm an international brand, we have a huge national presence, somebody books a service someplace that I'm not, or they want to book a service, I'd be a fool not to want to take that and then pass it on to a friend, somebody I know. So I could do that. We could take the appointment, we could refer it and full disclosure, it's being delivered by a third party. Great. So we can do that. We have that opportunity and we have operating partners, bigger markets where people can actually partner with us and they can get involved for little or no money and they they share it and they ultimately earn themselves to equity in the business. And it's great because the industry, when I came into it, was you know much more disorganized. It was not viewed as professional. And there was this great organization called the International Detailing Association that still to this day, you know, fights for all of those things to better the standard, to, to help organize. And I love it. And I was on the board for years and I was the president of it. So I really do believe passionately in it. Nowadays, we, you know, we have professional networks of people that know each other and I can refer business out very easily to somebody else and we all can enjoy success. So the best partnerships are those that everybody wins. When I do business and I get involved with somebody, I want to be involved with people that are smart, people that know good business, but people that ultimately are nice, right? I don't want the Wall Street shark that wants to gut everybody and they get everything and everybody else can die. That's like not the type of people. I'm too old for that shit, to be honest. Um, you know, I want to work with people that are nice. When I was talking to I have a prospective uh, market partner out West, and he's, you know, trying to get an idea of what a day in the life would be. I'm like, I want you to be the guy walking around, handing out waters, patting people on the back and picking your head up and looking for buildings and places for us to go. That's literally what I want him to do. Right. Shake babies, kiss hands, build business. So, you know, when we're looking at all these different things that we're going through today with a different uh, partner and we're like, OK, let's show them what the process we're going to do. We look we we brought up, right? There's a whole planning agenda. These are all tools that we need, right? We got a, a BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. We have timelines, budgets, tasks, right? People's names get put to it. Barriers, right? He's constantly asking people about their barriers. We got a little bit of feedback, Stan. And I'm assuming it's- I got nothing going on. No? No, my headset died, so that was the noise you heard before. Okay. So so here's a good... Right, I can make noise if you want me to. You're good at it. Yeah. All right. Here's a great planning document. This is what we do every time we have anything out of the norm. This is the document we use. We have Atlantic Station. So here's the Atlantic Station planning thing. It's got a whole bunch of stuff on it. It's got lots of descriptions of what people have to do. You know, Stan's like, oh, my God, where has this been the whole time? I've been in Atlanta... <laughs> So this is our backbone. It's got the timing I talked about, everything you need to do to get your business off the ground, everything down to like, you know, if you had to get inspection, you know, clipboards hung, office supply run. And then we built this other thing, right? We have an information form. This keeps everybody organized. So this keeps everybody organized. We have sales projections. We're going to go back to that in a second. We have a use of funds. And the use of funds, if you look at this thing, it's pretty cool. It's actually, it's linked up, right? So if I want to see what these leasehold improvements are, I go here and I say, okay, those are the leasehold improvements. And the uh, uh, perfect timing, I want this off here. The, uh, so those are things that when we go and we have to build out a place, these are things that are considered leasehold improvements. Basically, they're going to get put in and never taken out. FF&E, furniture, fixtures, equipment. Here's everything that we do. And literally, I can go in here and I can put it in there. Key exchanges, everything. Boom, pops out numbers. So we have this for everything, right? We have assets and vehicles, what they cost to build. 
franchise in a box. We show up like no other. You become a franchisee of ours, a box shows up and it's got everything you need to immediately. It's got big old signage and things like that in it that pop out and you're instantaneously, you know, up and running. So anybody out there, and these are the reason I show this stuff to the world is because anybody thinking about having turning their business into a franchise, investing in a franchise, doing something, this is the stuff that you should be looking for. It's really the core and the heart of the company that matters. And guys like Stan are, you know, I want guys around me with a vast amount of experience because ultimately it makes it easier and better. And Stan, what did you tell me that you want your job to be ultimately that you're going to do with our uh-huh. franchise? Oh, I well, think I- yeah, you too. You took the words out of my mouth with the owners because all I want to do is go into the different uh, different places all over the country or wherever we may be and be able to say, hey, how you doing? What's going on today? What can I do for you? And give them a hug because they're kicking and they're doing what they needed to do. Pat them on the back, but also challenge them on the other side. What's going on? What do we have to help you with? Because as a franchise, people don't always get the support they want from the franchisee. That's why we're we're so no, the, way, the, franchise, the franchisee doesn't get the support. I don't think. No, and, it, and it's like we got to make sure that we take care of them. And if that means, and I gave Jonathan this example earlier, that if we go into a town, Egypt, Idaho, I don't know if there is really one, but if there is, I apologize. Really? But anyhow. They, if we go into town and the guy's struggling or the partner is struggling with, I, I need to know how to, I can't build sales. I, I, I'm just dying. We're going to go out right then and there. We're going to go somewhere. Or we're going to go find him some sales. We're not going to say, oh, here's the plan. And, and we write this gorgeous plan out and it's five pages long and a lot of checklists there. We're going to go out and do. And that's what I think that people need to see and that we're going to do. As a, as a standard is, our people, when they go in, they're going to make sure we're doing the right things the right way, the way they were, they were taught, because they're all going to be certified in training in Atlanta. And at the same time, be able to know that we can go and help you on anything. You need uniforms? We're making a phone call right now. Let's get it. If yeah. you need a piece of paper, we'll go get it. it. And it's that simple, because my philosophy in my whole entire career has been, if you have a barrier... What do we need to do to remove it? I'll tell a quick story about the, the place in Dulles. It was before Jonathan joined me. It was, I think it was, it, it, I think it was a Burger King before it was a Wendy's. But let's say it was Burger King. And I'm coming in there and I'm coming from out of town. And this girl's on the register and she's like this. And, you know, like she's going to fall asleep. And I said, hey, how you doing? What's going on? And she said, oh, what do you want? And it's like, okay. So I ordered some food and I sat down and I watched her. She did this like for 10 minutes. So I finally, I went behind the line, introduced myself to everybody. And of course, she was now surprised, wasn't feeling too good about it. But the bottom line was, I said, hey, when you're done with your shift, can I talk to you? She said, sure. And I said, okay. So when I sat down and talked to her, it was funny. In, in, in the sense of what was so important for her, the barrier that she had was a single mom working two jobs and had one uniform for Burger King and was cleaning it every night because that's her standard in life. She would not go to work with a dirty uniform. She wanted to, and she was tired of asking. I made a phone call and she had uniforms the next two days. And then she told everybody in the airport because we had other operations. We just didn't have Burger Kings. We had other operations. And people say, what? He did that? And so like now when I would come into town and be like, hey, can I talk to you? (laughs) Hey, can I talk to you? But I like that because if they know they have a source and that's what we're going to be, we're going to be a source of support that, that, uh, that spreadsheets that Jonathan showed you that package deal there, it is a turnkey atmosphere. It's a turnkey to say from get to go, this is what we're going to do to help you. This is what we're going to do to make you successful. Does it mean that they don't do anything? Of course not. There's a lot of work for them to do. You know, that's like one of the guys said today, well, his son's going to run the business. And we said, okay. And he says, well, I think I want to come for training. And it's like, why not? You need to come. You need to come. That was great, actually. That was fantastic, actually. He's like, yeah, and I was like, <laughs> I'm like, God, yeah. The it more is great. great. It was great. And it's like, we now we're making a plan. Tomorrow we're going to sit down. We're going to fill up the whole thing, the whole chart, whatever it takes to know 
that and then we got to back it up, obviously. And we know we're going to be able to do that because of the support we have. Will we miss something? Maybe because we're human, but at the same time, that's where we say, okay, hey, we missed that. Let's do better the next time because there are going to be a bunch of next times and we get better as we go along. But I guess my point is it's been created. Let's sharpen it. Let's use it. Because my system um, back in the old days, like I'll go into Wendy's today and I'll tell you, Wendy's was my foundation for all my leadership. So I thank them for that for over the years. But I knew Dave, right? Yeah. I I knew Dave. He would come into town and say, where's Stan? We need to sit down and talk. And we'd eat. And the newspaper would come home and he wouldn't say one word. He'd make me answer all the questions. But funny guy. Loved the guy. He was a normal guy. That's what it was. But I I was talking to this franchisee one time and uh, they took me a tour around uh, because they wanted me to come to work. Like January, February this year. And it's like, no, I don't want to, but let's see. So I would look at something and I said, oh, you like that system? And they said, yeah. I said, I created that. <laughs> and she said, what? And I said, yeah. And then we went to something else. I said, I created that too. And she's looking at me like I'm lying to her or something. And I said, you call anybody that has been around for more than since 80s, the early 80s. I said, they'll tell you. Some guy in Texas, that's where I used to live at the one time or another, created this. And it was simple. Because what I wanted to do was make it idiot proof for my managers to work. When I was a training store manager, when I got a trainee that worked at Burger King, McDonald's, wherever, Whataburger, all these different places, I wanted them to come in and say, this is how you make our single cheese everything. Pictures, diagrams. So now I'm providing that here because in the box means in the box. When it says to put the clipboard on here, that's what it means. If it says to put a mileage log inside the car, because we want to make sure the car is being utilized for a company, that's what it means. And it's accountability, trip that a lot of people don't like. But oh, gotcha. at resist. the end of the day, how can, you, how can you argue with it? It's like, did you do this? Yeah, I did. Okay, well, show me. Did you do your checklist this morning to say you had all your chemicals, but now you're calling me saying, I need someone to rush this over to me. I need, I need the carpet shampoo. And it's like, well, did you check your car out this morning? Uh, yeah. And then I look at the chart and it's not done. So it's like, you know, it's an accountability thing. That's what systems are. And Wendy's was great with that. I had a guy, the, the vice president at Wendy's, he came to me. I was running a store next to where the Texas Rangers play. And I just took it off. I'm having, oh, I'm, ha- I'm having huge success. We were doing 14 grand a week. I had it up to 25. I was training. So I, if I didn't want to work, I worked. If I did, I did. That's how it was in the old days. But he's visiting me and he says, so talk to me about how you open up the store. So it's like, I do this, I do that, I do this. He says, well, how does everybody know how much lettuce to do and tomatoes and this and that? And I said, well, we have a conversation in the morning. Okay, Sally, you do four cases of lettuce because this is what sales are. And blah, blah. He said, but I don't see it anywhere. So something happens to you. You're on vacation. God bless. We're going to let you go on vacation. How's it going to run? I said, well, my people know. Mm-hmm. He says, not good enough. And that's how I started to learn. I started posting flow charts. This is where it goes. This is where it happens. This is what time it happens. Here's your time goal. If you don't hit it, we're going to have a conversation. Why? If you're going to take two hours to do three cases of lettuce and you're going to take three hours to do one case of lettuce, we have a productivity issue and I'm going to address it. But it was all in writing. So you could always go back to a problem that was going on, whether it be restaurants, uh, selling keychains on the side street. It don't matter. You can go back to it and say, did I do this? And if I didn't, you'll find automatically it's because you didn't follow the system. That's my point. If anybody's ever tuned in to Jimmy and Johnny before, if that is not me to a T, the things that you just said, every time there's a problem in your business, you can go back and you can see it's either a system that needs to exist and doesn't, or there's the one that they didn't use. And it happens all the time. It's so one of the, it's, you know, we'll talk about it, but it relates to, to this business. One of the things that Burger King introduced, which I thought was cool, they they used to take the closing checklist and then the opener, they had a column where the opener would come in and open and he would rate the close. And if you look at our blue book, we have a daily management book. It's got all the checklists and stuff in it. If you look in there, there's a, the first thing you do is you do your figure eight around your business and you rate the close, right? That they do everything. If not, you know, you're going to have a conversation, but those types of systems keep 
when I hear grumbling in business, it's usually because of management, not like that management isn't there and it's not management pitching, but when things aren't happening and like you talk your girl with the uniforms, right? That's management. They're not managing the business that when they're counting their food, are they counting their marketing supplies and their uniforms and, and then placing the right orders and maintaining par levels on the sheet that I just had off it, you know, literally next to it was a par level for what it was to, to like, here's what we were looking at. It's like, here's the par level for a fixed site. Right. It's that column gets put over here and it gives me all the math. So like those are systems. Now, if somebody all of a sudden they don't know about this system and they, you know, my favorite is people go into a restaurant. They might have worked at the same restaurant and they go into a new restaurant in a different location, but they order like they're at the old restaurant. Right. They're just like, oh, yeah, I need 20 cases of this and this, you know, like their inventory is like whacked. Well, you can't do your order and inventory from the office, okay? You have to go where the supplies are. <laughs> it's one thing I learned, right? And we used to do it on a piece of paper like this big, right? Full extensions, you know, but you can't do it from the office. And so like, that's the stuff that I love today. And Prado Wash has been around for a long time, okay? But it, and it survived and it prospered and grew. But it was just like, uh. Now, today, with the core of good systems, with all these things really tweaked out, now we get more juice from our squeeze on a location because it is really, really organized. And what you said, I think, is fundamental for every business. And I learned it at the Ritz-Carlton. It's constant and never-ending improvement. So what's going to happen now is we have great stuff. I brought everything here already a couple of years ago, and we've implemented a lot of it. Now Stan's going to come in, and he's going to be like, that's all great, but why couldn't we make that one thing better? And like, that'll be his stamp. His stamp will be to take it all just another notch up. And then when he circles around, it'll come back and it's like, okay, let's take it another notch up. And that's why we are hands down the industry leaders in this business. That's why we have phenomenal growth, huge projections, investment opportunities out the wazoo. That's all because of what we do. So like this is fundamental to us. And if you don't have these tools in your business, I don't care what you're doing. You're selling keychains on the side of the road. You got to have an inventory, right? Because what happens if, you know, you get a big fair coming up and people coming to town, you don't have enough. What's the old saying? If you got a hot dog cart, you got a hundred hot dogs, you better have a hundred buns. So you you know, know, your business should be this organized. That's funny. My daughter just walked in. And that's when Jonathan met my daughter back when she was probably maybe seven or eight years old. This but is she used to call back. me? Yeah. What'd you call me? Trouble. Yeah. <laughs> trouble. And it was funny because it took your daughter to work day. So we get on a plane. We go to Pittsburgh. And we had uh, Charlie's Grilled Subs there. And one of the biggest things in the airport, if you don't realize, is sampling. People walk by, you sample. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Would you like to sample so people can taste it, walk away and say, oh, I'm going to go back there because they don't come to the airport to eat. And here is a six, seven year old. We told her what to do based on the system. And she was going out where people were sitting at waiting for their plane and brought this sandwich cut up in probably 10 different pieces. And before you knew it, people are starting to run back. Oh, she's so <clears throat> pretty, blah, 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 blah. But the point is we hired the right person at that time to go do that because she was out there. She made it happen. We got sales from it. And that's where, you know, not only you got to follow your system, you got to have the right people. And, and, and I say that, you know, when I've interviewed over the years, different jobs of different people, well, what's your number thing, one thing? And it's like operations number one. I said, you got to operate. And down there, there's all these levels of systems, blah, 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 blah. Bottom line is you got to perform, you got to have high performing teams. If you don't have high performing people, that are going to work for you and understand all of that. What are you going to do? How, how do you succeed? You know, people say, I remember someone interviewed me a long time ago. Well, when you hire someone and they want your job, well, what do you think? And I said, let them take it. And they said, you're not, you're not, you're not worried. I said, no, I'd rather my people. I left uh, my last company, the big company I left. And the girl that was a lonely person, a trainee, I'll say it, HR block. She was <laughs> she was a tax preparer and she ends up now running my old district. 
whether she's doing good, bad, or different don't matter, but she's doing it because over those years, we listened, we talked, we shared ideas, we came up with new stuff because it was stuff I didn't know, she didn't know, we started exploring. But my point is you've got to take the time to really get the people in there because if you do, then all you do, and he's got the pillars up there, is once you get your people in and show them the operation, it's just, I used to hate going to any meeting. I don't care what brand I was in, whatever it was. If we were talking about the minimum standard, like if we were talking about food costs and labor, I was pissed because all I want to talk about is sales. I want to talk about how we're going to build the bottom top line because everything flows to the bottom. If you have your controls in place, if you've got your people in place, if you're scheduling right, are you making sure that you're doing the right things marketing wise? Sales, sales, sales. Then you got to have your people grow because nobody wants to work fries at Wendy's all their life. They want to get, they want to proceed. They want to move on or they don't want just to be the tax preparer. They want to be the DM. They want to be the person who's in charge of the whole area and, and, and be able to expand their wings or go into marketing or go into uh, consumer affairs, you know, people, there's so many different things that they could go into. So maybe that's where I get it from, because, you know, and I said it the other day, you know, I think it's really important. And it was one of the first things that I did in this industry when I came into it, you know, almost 10 years ago was I, I made sure that the people understood that there were levels and achievements and they could grow and there was a path for them. And I, I must have gotten that from you over the years of like, you know, really instilling that because historically, you know, at, at a, the old school car wash, you know, the guy, you know, I, I had an old partner that was like kind of a dick um, and he would like threaten people. Right. One of those guys, you know, and, and his comment would be like, oh, if you don't like it, then you'll be bent over and we'll have a vacuum duct tape to your hand. <laughs> kind of funny. But, you know. <laughs> But it's like, oh, my God, it's like, but that's like, you know, to him, that guy was just, you know, capped. And it's like, no, like, let's teach that guy that if he does it well, then he can like, you know, like I said the other day, it's like stripes in the military, you know, hey, if you can do 500 services, now you're, you know, a higher level, you're a sergeant, then you're a major, you know, and, and up and up and up. And for us, it's they can get to be, you know, a master detailer, they can be a trainer, they can be a supervisor, manager, owner, like that is how it works for us. So I agree. And I think I got that from you somewhere along the way of really instilling that, because again, I think the food service industry is one of those that, you know, people feel like they're a little bit stuck. I never felt that way. I always wanted that CEO's job. You know, I wanted his job from the get go, but I want to call bullshit on you. Okay. But before you said, you know, what's the number one thing you said operations. I asked you that question a month ago and the number one thing was not operations. Do you remember what you said? Uh, I said people. You said your family, which is oh, true. That, yeah, that's true. That was your number one. You were like, okay, you know, because it's not about money and that stuff at our age, right? It's about doing something that you care about, building something, having some fun. And yeah, the first thing you said, it's like, okay, family, quality of life, right? Then it's like, you know, then it's operation. Then it was like, then it was, you know, people and then money was like way down here you know so i just appreciate that about you and you've always told me to hear your daughter walking through it was nice to see her a couple of weeks ago and have lunch and stuff like that was cool and it's so funny to look you know 20 plus years she's got kids and it's like amazing so i threw the pillars up because you know i really do believe that this is how business works and you know in the first pillar just so happens to be people that is no accident, folks, <laughs> right? But ultimately, you got to have operations. They need to be organized. Your marketing, your sales, your management, your financials, it all needs to be built on a foundation of solid systems. Every one of those, everything there has a checklist in our world that I could show you. If you want to see that checklist, go in, on success systems and go do the business assessment but it literally will show you the checklist for every one of those pillars. And I'll be surprised if, if you have a business out there and you have 70% of the stuff that we have going on, if you have 70%, I'll be impressed. And most people are successful, but imagine if you could close the gap on tightening up everything and every one of those pillars in your own business. So one thing I do want to jump into, which is like the big controversy that I alluded to earlier, Stan, is I want to look and share some numbers. 
So we looked at the right. We looked at the core structure, how we get to like use of funds and backwards into like planning locations. But the big one I want to get into is this. It's something that I actually do share with people when they are franchisees. The uh, move this thing around. Sorry. The uh, do to do financials. Okay. Now in here. And this is a very generic, I'm speaking as an industry professional, not as the chairman and CEO of Prana Wash. But you'll look, like these things look really similar, okay? This is like a budgeting model. I'm gonna show it for like eight tenths of a second. Okay, it's over here. So this is a budgeting model that we use in this company, PW, right? Okay, so everybody take a quick look, mental snapshot, okay. But here I wanted to show like, general what the hand car washing detailing business financials should look like so if i was talking to somebody out there and they were asking me their advice the thing i would say is like if i had the benchmark look at some numbers these are the numbers i would look at so stan can you see that stan i can definitely make it bigger by the way yeah make it bigger i'm old if I had a nickel for every time I said that. Yeah. I'd have a lot of nickels. Um, okay. So let's go here. Okay. And I'm even going to show some stuff here at the bottom. I just want everybody to see. Wow. It's really weird. It has three tabs, just like that other sheet. Um, okay. So here's the mobile model, right? There's definitely different models. I was talking about the car wash on the corner. Like that's a different model. That's like, it's, it's a, a real estate play and the only model that really works now in that right the old full service tunnel lots of guys touching cars like that's that's not the profit model if you talk to anybody in that business the model now is the five dollars car wash and you know vacuums and all that stuff are free it's because they can pump more widgets out of that factory and it costs them very little to wash a car but they don't have the 10 guys on the other side at, you know, look at labor these days. It's ridiculous in any industry. You know, I got guys making, you know, 25 bucks an hour. That's the hourly rate out in California. The reality is our technicians make between 20 and 35, depending on what they're doing and the, the service. So we always have a good pay and comp package, but, you know, when you look at it back then, it's you, you, you have a bunch of guys wiping down cars manually with a towel to get it finally dry at 15, 20 bucks an hour. You can't do it. It's unsustainable. And the economics don't work. But to put people through that machine, that factory, and get them to go do it themselves, uh, it, it's very, very, you know, we had two. So when we started Spippy, we had a full service tunnel car wash and we had a, an express wash. And literally, the express wash so outperformed the other one. We we actually used it to cover the debt of the other one because the other one would lose money and the express would like carry the whole company. So here's numbers. These are like, so everybody, anybody looking at the numbers here, these are, I'm going to give you some baseline assumptions you can make. And there's three models. There's a mobile model. There's a location model. Okay. That's like a fixed location, but we always look at this stuff with mobile. Um, because I believe that if you're doing it these days, you definitely should have a mobile component. And then, you know, if you happen to be in the airport business, you know, we are the largest provider of car washing detailing to, to airports. The, um, so same thing. So you'll see a couple of differences. I just wanted you guys to see out of the gate. So the number that I look at and I talk about all the time, and I have a slide and the slide says 400 times five times 52 equals $104,000. Okay. That's $400 a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year revenue on a mobile vehicle at 104,000. If a technician makes 30% and you know, he's only operating that one vehicle five days, we don't run five days by the way. Um, and, and that's really like one shift. I really would love to see that vehicle like a, a, NASCAR pit crew, right? Like, or, no, it's the Le Mans, right? It's a 24-hour race, right? They come, they yank out the driver, they they fuel it up, they put another driver in, and out he goes. That's that's how I look at mobile. If I can do it, I would have it where the vehicle pulls in and like and they plug it in and like everything refills and the guy's out the door. And like, how long how long does it take in F one? 
what? For a pit stop? Um, under three, well. Under three seconds, definitely. Yeah. 2.9. 2.9, you know, oh my God. I want him out the door in 2.9 seconds and back on the road. So you think of airports as kind of a cool model because if when we're in the airports, we can wash cars. We know when people are returning. So I know like, you know, Stan, you flew out, you left your car, you're going to be back today at 10 a.m. Well, I can back into that and know that I got to get your car done before you come back. We always say that we do it within 24 hours. We actually do it within four. Um, but I can plan that pretty well. And if I plan it, that that service happens in the off hours, so say before six o'clock and after six o'clock, that means from six to six, that same vehicle that would be servicing that car at an airport can actually be out at a building, servicing a building, and then at night it does it. So now I don't get $400 a day, I get 800, really 1200, you know, let's be conservative. So, but those are just some basic metrics that I like to see. So when I'm looking at this and you see mobile, it in my world, this is two mobile vehicles, right? So if I'm gonna have a business, I'm not gonna have anything less than two mobile vehicles. My products and supplies are relatively inexpensive. It's not the big cost thing in the food service industry. Yes, labor and food. In most cases, it was food over labor, which is weird. In our world, it's all labor, but we have a good labor model. We pay our technicians a percentage of the service. So they get 30% on the service, but they also have the ability to get more. So if that vehicle is supposed to do $400 a day and they do six, then they get you know 32%. If they get to seven, they get 35%. So it, it creates this environment where they're definitely invested, but it also gets that extra service at the end of the day. They're driving back. They they just finished up at a recurring service location, a building, and they're driving back. And we have that, you know, that enterprise detail that we got to get done. Well, if I know I'm at 650 and I'm going to go do a, you know, a $75 interior detail and it's going to give me three more points on the day plus my commission on it. Well, guess what? Tell me where it is. I'm on my way, right? So it's just things like that that we know that work. But the baseline is we, we look at 30%. Vehicle cost, you know, it's in here, but it's backed in here really as a cost if you were going to be paying for the vehicle over time, which is a good way to look at it. If you ever hear me really talk, I usually talk about 42% labor and 8% all in product cost, 50% gross margin. So the reason that I always talk about it that way is because I usually don't have the vehicle cost in there. And when I look at the labor, I like to budget that extra 12%, one for the flex in the labor, but also for supervisory. You know, you gotta have somebody that's like in charge over there. So then I, I go down, I'm like, so I got my gross margin. I pop 10% in for management labor. The reason I look at it that way is because I know companies that actually will manage a franchise business and they charge 10%. So I like to budget it in there. So employee related expenses, 2%, 2%, I don't know. It's the old Barnum and Bailey, right? 50% of my advertising works, 50% doesn't. If I could figure out what it was, I, I would, if I figured out what didn't work, I would stop doing it. You got to put some extra stuff in your P and L because things come up, but that's like fun stuff. That's it. That's buying bucket hats and cool, cool things to go around their necks and the, the party of Christmas and that type of stuff. Marketing promotion, you know, I pop in 5%. I think it's a good number. You, you have to reinvest in the business. You have to be doing marketing and promotions. Rent, rent's a really interesting one for us. You know, this is budgeted at 1100 bucks a month. That's all over the scale in our, our world. I will say this though, in my experience, malls are really high. And uh, my experience through COVID was they didn't give two craps. It was, we have no traffic, screw you, pay me. And I'm not a big fan of that. Um, but I also have buildings that are, you know, campuses that don't charge me anything and they look at it as amenity. So there's a full spectrum. My experience, especially on mobile, the reason I budgeted the 1100 bucks, that's more for like, if I didn't have a place to put my stuff, I would have to rent a storage location or have some type of hub, right? Got to park these things, got to like redo them. The beauty is, though, in my world, when I go into a city, the way we market and we turn on this uh, magic sales system, when we do that whole process, we end up with 
a lot of opportunity to have places to put our things without having to have a centralized hub that we actually pay out of pocket. When we build Spiffy, we go into a city and pay eight or 10,000 bucks for like an Amazon warehouse type thing. And literally, I remember being in, in uh, Farmer's Branch, Texas, right? Right outside of Dallas. And it was like our place and there was the Amazon warehouse. So we would go into some industrial thing. We'd get a lot of space because we'd like to keep the vehicles secure. But my experience is, you know, you can do that definitely different. And the reason that I liked Prado Wash so much when I found it was they had individual locations like Tampa, right? You look at the map of Tampa, they were like one here, one here, one here, one here. I was like, oh, why don't we just put two mobiles at each of those? Now I got eight mobile vehicles and you draw the circles and they all loop and connect. <laughs> so I like that model. I'd rather have the vehicles spread out a little bit. And I learned that actually in California. We were in L.A., and we had come from the East Coast. We bought a company called Squeegee and we had assimilated them into our brand. But, you know, if you've ever been on the, the 405 at five o'clock and you're trying to go from Hollywood to like, you know, Orange County, good luck. OK, you got hours ahead of you. So we would literally pay guys, you know, almost as much as they made doing services sitting in traffic. So our idea was put a satellite up there and put a satellite down here and deploy from two different places. So that's where I came up with the original concept. And then I found Prano Wash or they found me. Um, you know, I always budget IT, phones, repairs and maintenance, insurance. Insurance is variable. This is at $462 a month. That's exactly what I pay at one of my locations. That includes garage keepers and all this other stuff. So, you know, but I've seen lower, which is nice. And I've had higher. So the uh, royalties in our world, royalties to a, a franchise run, you know, six, eight, 10%. I have six in here budgeted, you know, and not that these are franchise numbers at all. Okay. Uh, you're supposed to laugh, Stan. Right. You got to pay bank charges, 3%. You're processing credit cards. You got to clean your towels and, you know, utility stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, easily putting off, you know, 17%. Now, if I had to, if I had to adjust this and show what I think is reality, if if it was mine solely, not anything to do with it, I would go and I would take this number out. I would take this number out. And yep, that works. Okay. But the reality is if I also was doing this, I would put this up to. that. And me as the owner, that's what I'd be looking at. That was if it was mine, not a franchise company by any means. So, you know, but knowing that that's not the world that I live in, I would, if I was going to look at numbers and I would go with kind of that path, knowing that I can get a lot of squeeze out of there. If I, no, the other number that I could get rid of too is, is that. So, you know, and then the sales number to me, the beauty of the business when I look at mobile is if I'm busy and all of my trucks are out Monday through Friday, they're going somewhere else on the weekends and I'm at capacity for four or 500 bucks, I can go get another truck for another 5,000. I can wrap it and upfit it. And I got a whole nother arm of my business operating. And so my sales are limitless is what I would say. Would you agree with that, Stan? Yeah, and that's what people got to look at because there's so many different variables. I work for a company, a startup that took X amount of percent and put it away for party at the end of the year for December because they want to make sure that they could sit there and reward their people. So every month they say, we're going to do this. And then I work for a different other one who said, every month we're going to give $1,000 and donate it to a worthy cause. And everybody would vote on it, whether it be American Heart Association, United Way, Alzheimer's. And it wasn't for publicity. It really wasn't. It was to sit there and give back something. But that was all in the pro forma. That was in our budget. That was there. So we knew we could go and do it. We never touched it. I mean, it's like, so if we didn't have a good month, it wasn't like, oh, we don't do the $1,000. Forget about it. It was, where do we get it from somewhere else? But I, I liked both methods because the first one put it away to reward people at the end of the year. 
you know, and as COVID hit and all that stuff, it was instead of going to a restaurant, maybe it's we all just get together and do a buffet at the office and the yeah, come come to my house, I'll cook it up on the grill for yeah. you. Yeah. So and I in the years when I was in uh in the Atlanta airport, we had we had a Christmas party every year in December. And I ever there was 80 people in my house floating in and out and doing what <laughs> now. No, I don't even know what they were doing, but the, <laughs> I the bottom imagine. line. The bottom line was instead of spending 30, 40, 50 bucks a head, we decided, and everybody was on board. Everybody brought something. Everybody had some fun. So I'm just saying to, to, as an example of that, like when John says, hey, this is what you can make. Well, it's all up to you. You know, you live in different places. It could be Minnesota is different than L.A. L.A. is different than, you know, uh, Farmers Branch, Texas, you know, or Arlington, Texas, which is different than, you know, Everett, Massachusetts. It could be a whole different ball game. Hey, Sam, there is doing. an Egypt. I did get confirmation. There is an Egypt, <laughs> Idaho, or wherever the hell you said. There Iowa, is, yeah, there you go. It's yeah, a neighborhood. I mean, there is uh, one, by the way. I wanted to come full circle on that for everybody that was wondering. I stay. I stand to my thing. I'm going to go and visit them now and make yeah, sure that we get. I used to make fun of Kalamazoo, and Jimmy's actually from Kalamazoo. I didn't yeah. know a real place. I've been yeah. there. So really, what Jonathan wants you to get out of this is, it's a preparation. It's a thought process. It's only his opinion. This is not the gospel. This is not. Oh, Jonathan said I could do this. No, it's not. You know, it's like you know when you used to tell people to do that. Well, Stan said. It's no, you take ownership in it. This is what I think. Here's an example of our systems only work for people who want to participate in it. And, and, that, and that was the biggest thing was, is say, say someone after today's uh, call, they come in and they say, well, I have a system I want you guys to look at. And we may say, hey, I like that. You ever watch the Food Network and Guy oh, Fieri man. is doing his thing? And he says, I'm stealing that for my job, for my restaurant. And he will. He does. And it's not because everybody copies everybody. And, yeah. I, and I will tell you that no matter what, where you're at, when McDonald's came out with McNuggets, Wendy's waited five years to make sure it was going to work before they did nuggets. But of course, we're going to do better. And then Burger King came out with it and said, we're going to do better than both of them. You know, well, they just said we're going to do it cheaper. Yeah, <laughs> everybody got in the game. And, you know, then chicken strips. And now, you know, what's this new chicken sandwich that KFC and and Popeyes and everybody's in on that. But yeah, the spicy, Panera. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's spicy, you know. We're yeah, literally, barbecue. I have one on my desk from Chick-fil-A. Yeah, we're going to do barbecue chicken. All they do is dunk it in barbecue sauce. I mean, it's the same chicken. So it's like, so again, to, to full circle, Again, I guess the theme today is we have systems in place that work for us. If it's not, what do we got to do to fix it? Or what do we got to do to create one? And you got to make it as simple. I tell, I was telling the, the supervisor here in Atlanta, we went for a late lunch yesterday and I was going over his duties and yep, got that, got that. And I said, I want to dumb it down. And he looked at me like, what do you think we're stupid? And it wasn't, I said, he didn't come out and say that, but I could see in his face and said, listen, I want us to train people that come in and be able to look at a picture that says, here's the spray that you use to take care of this. Here's the towel that you use for this. This is where it goes afterwards. This is where it's stored. This is where you get back. So that one thing, you can't say, I don't know what to do with it because it's right there. It's, it, and it goes back to my training at Wendy's. How do you make a single cheese everything? And it was spelled out. And they had pictures finally, visual training. How do you make it, Stan? You know, oh, it's uh, uh, white, <laughs> white, red, green, white, red, green. I remember that. <laughs> pickle, onion, tomato, lettuce. I'll never forget oh, it. My it. Never. And I'll never forget that because that's the way. So, like, if I go to if I go to Wendy's and someone says no tomato or no ketchup, I'll say no ketchup, no tomato because that's the order it goes in. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing, but that's what I do. But it's like anything else, you know, with HR, HR Block. You had to make an appointment. We had to confirm your appointment. We had to bring it in. We had to see your stuff. You had to sign a thing that says we could take your stuff. There was so many things. And COVID changed our world. And really, we're in the best part of this because if you look at it, a lot of the restaurant business changed their profile. They changed it to you know, Chick-fil-A was the smartest one of them all. No dining rooms. We have drive through open. 
but we're going to get make, really good at it. And we are awesome at it. We got double drive throughs We got nobody's outside right now, but I tell you what, I don't have to clean my dining room. I don't have to wash the be- the restrooms anymore for right now. And they mm-hmm. were making double of what they were doing just through the drive through and the speed of service was just as good. Yeah. Now they open back their, their, their insides because people like to go there and hang out. The kids like to go there because they got the playground, but everybody's got to change because of the time that we're in. And so our business mobile detail, I, I would tell you the guy used to go to around the corner here and, and I'm in Woodstock, Georgia. And I always used to go because they would do it. They would do the vacuuming. They would clean the windows. They would do, and it's like, now I have a choice. I could go do it and do the rest myself, or I could pay someone triple the amount of money. And they only take two to three cars a, a week. And it's like, really? So then now on the other side of me, big Dan's car wash. He's going everywhere. This yeah. guy thinks he's got something gold. And what is it? You go and you go through, you use his water, and then you got to go take care of the vacuum cleaner. And God bless America the other day, the vacuum cleaner didn't work and says, we'll have him working tomorrow. So it's like, <laughs> you know, it's just it's just hilarious. And look at some of these things. And we come in, and Jonathan was right. We could go to Target Shopping Center, put the car out there, and if we get one car, there's five others behind it saying, when are you going to take care of me? Oh, my goodness. I could just, I could literally, I could go pop up a tent right now. And I'll be there all night. Yeah, and it's and that's the vision that people get excited about when we talk about franchising or being a master franchise or just being part of our company. My next door neighbor, great operator, great sales guy. And I start talking about this, and it's like he sat and talked to Jonathan. And as we grow, we're going to utilize him because he gets it. It's like, I don't care how much you pay me. I'll pay you to come work for a little while because I want to be part of the vision. But it goes back to this pillars, people, having the right people making sure we got the right systems in place, make sure we're doing the operations. But this, this financial thing, it's all up to the individual person. You know, you may be an insurance guy who get the insurance dirt cheap. So of course, of course your, your value is going to do it now. Oh, we have people that are already in other brands, tropical smoothie, they're doing their old pest control. They're doing this. They understand the business already. They just want to expand. They want to get different they want to have yeah they want to just do some more things and it's like great come on board we'll take you for the ride you already get it those are the people we really want we want people who already know what's going on and be able to do that because they get it they know it works and you know the pest control guy he probably worked for the biggest pest control company there was and said i'm going on my own because i could do it better that's how how he's got a good good guy's good now he's got a good one. He's, it was a family owned business and they just sold the family owned business after a bunch of years and everybody got taken care of. But yeah, like what I, I end up talking to a couple of different types of people all the time. I talk to guys that have more money than time, right? Millionaires and billionaires all the time. I talk to people that have no money, but want, they love the business. They love the environmental friendly side, all those things. And we have a great path. So it's funny. I just threw this back up because we didn't touch on it, but you know, People always want to know how much it costs to do it, right? And it really depends on like your license agreement and like, you know, and I tell people today, I'm like, buy as much territory as you can buy because that will like, you know, it's, you're not gonna be able to get more of that if you buy it and then somebody else buys the one next to you and the one next to you. So buy as much as you can because you can always add vehicles and locations. And then here's, you know, here's a, an example, and I'm not going to go through it, but I left it up for a long time. So if anybody is interested in the finance, I take a screenshot and kind of look at this. But it's two different versions of how I, I would build it. When I build it, I go and I just buy the vehicles outright. We invest in them. Boom, they're done. We depreciate them. Well, there's a whole other value engineering model here that's about, you know, $40,000 you know, it's not any cheaper at the end of the day, but it's how you deploy your money and how you do that that makes sense. And these, both of these show it and it shows the assumptions that I was making on the other, but I left that up for a little bit in this. And, and there's my statement at the bottom stand, you know, like, this is not financial advice. We're not talking about pronto wash. We're talking about the state of the industry. And if I could do it, this is what I would do. So yeah, anyway, that's, that's I'm going to be clear on that as we wrap it up there. Yeah, yeah. got to be, got to be very, you know, do you see all these commercials? consult your tax tax advisor yes. 
it's almost exactly the same thing. They're not telling you that you have to pay taxes, but they're not telling you you had it. It all depends on your situation. As I learned very quickly in that business, there's a lot of ramifications. So, I mean, reach out to us, talk to us, uh, see what you want to talk about. Enjoy, come on and talk to us about what's going on with you and what's happening with you. We're, we'll be glad to because, you know. And that's any business, and that's the beauty. Yeah. It's so for me, you know, to have restaurant success, to have, you know, detail or insider secrets, you know, we have franchise success system. We have, you know, we have the whole print and digital marketing side. So if you need anything out there and you think that in some way, shape or form, a guy like me or a guy like Stan or a guy like Jimmy could help you, just reach out to us. We're really easy to find. Okay. You're like, LinkedIn, Jonathan Munzel, Facebook, Jonathan Munzel, <laughs> Instagram, Jonathan Munzel. So it's like really not that difficult, but if you want, just reach out and like, we'll show you how we do all this at, at, a, at a really, really high level and how we are growing. Uh, the future is so bright. I do have to wear shades, but it's so bright. And, it, and we do this in different industries. We do this with, you know, what we do today and we do it for other people every day as well so reach out to us i just hope that people got something from it i thought it was a fantastic call thank you for subbing in the uh jimmy if you're out there on your anniversary i'm sure you're watching this under the table you know while your wife is you know, ordering uh you know happy anniversary my brother we look forward to seeing you next week and i look forward to seeing a little bit more of stan as, as a as a guest um in future episodes so thank you so much i appreciate it Thank you, everybody out there. I am uh, signing off.